I'm in Detroit. When I'm in Detroit, the city knows it. And when I'm gone, the city knows it. And when I'm out, I have to get back to Detroit because this mother goes crazy when I'm not here. No matter where I am, I always have Detroit dust and dirt on the bottom of my feet, no matter where I stand. Nobody else walks like Kenny Dixon. He's got his own fly way of waltzing through life that's different than everybody else. I think that's, that's his magic. Kenny don't feel sorry for y'all. The other DJs, they might try something, and when they see the crowd not have any knowledge of something off of 4-4, they backspin out of it, Kenny ain't gonna do that. He likes to educate people about black culture. He's a teacher more so than a DJ. You follow me, right? All right. That's right. He's a very genuine person. He's a very, a very happy person. Also a very deep person. And he just lets everything come naturally. You know, and that also reflects itself inside of his music. Talk to me about those early influences and what made you kind of take that route in life to become this music maker, this ambassador for the D. Well, none of that was planned. We started off just making music and, and we didn't care where they ended up. We just enjoyed making the music. It was like our children. It kept us out the streets. Music just grabbed me and took me in another direction. Not by choice, but by, by habitat, I guess. Between my grandmother and my father, they were both totally different musicians. My grandmother, she's church. She could play that piano like a motherfucker. My father was more freestyle. He came up in the hippie era in the 60s and 70s, and she thought my father was playing devil's music. And when you grow up, you don't want to do what your parents do. My father sat and played that guitar and piano all the time, in the club, outside the club, at home. And my father played on a lot of stuff around the city of Detroit. And like a lot of things, he just didn't get no credit for. So he was, he had a fuck you attitude against the industry. So I guess that's where I get a lot of that from. But you know, unlike him, I, I never stopped. So let's talk about your, your first party that you remember DJing at. My grandfather owned a nightclub. I had the job of DJing and cleaning up at nine years old. Now keep in mind, DJing back then would just put the fucking record on, shut the fuck up, you're not getting paid, do what you're told. This is my grandfather. This is the guy who showed me how to get down and my appreciation for the whole jazz world and scene, even my acknowledgement came from this guy. He would put a stack up, he would like play anything in that stack for the rest of the night. And then from that, I just started stealing equipment on weekends and DJ my friends' backyard parties and just make sure the equipment is back at a certain time. Of course, it's always the neighborhood that starts booking you first. Maybe your boys just want to have a party. They know they ain't gonna pay no, they just have you come down, you know. And they were great. You didn't realize it at the time, but those are some of the best moments of your life. You're actually controlling a whole environment. Hope y'all having a good time. I got into a little trouble and I had to work. I had to get a job. One of my best friends was like, man, come on work at Buy Right. Buy Right was one of the first record stores that you could go in and buy shit you didn't even know you wanted. Kenny probably got a lot of record knowledge just hanging out when the older DJs come in and what they selected and the DJs talk to each other, man, what works, what don't. Buy Right was uh, instrumental and the guy should get a damn award from the city. He's still up there on Seven Mile. You either worked at Buy Right, you either had your music distributed at Buy Right, you either produce records at Buy Right, or you bought records from Buy Right. At Buy Right is, is a big part of the city, a big part of the music industry, and probably the best kept secret that Europe hasn't got a hold of yet. You know, at Buy Right Records wasn't selling your shit, wasn't nobody playing your shit. Yeah. This record store had one thing that no other record store I've ever been in had, and that was a club-like system inside of a record store. When you came in here, it was bumping. I worked here for about four straight years. I haven't been officially fired yet, or I haven't officially quit yet. I, I still just walk back in the back. It's like I still work here, it just, the pay rate is horrible now. It's just, I, I get half of nothing. 
The record store taught me a lot, showed me a lot. And through the record store, that's how I also met a whole lot of other people, including Theo, Marcellus, Omar S, which you just mentioned. I mean, that, that's a long list. And then also producing-wise, I started fiddling in other people's studios. And I'm like, wow, check this shit out. Kept, kept me off the street. I was more intrigued in what the fuck was going on in there. You've done your work on the productions and learning the equipment, and you know, you know where the history's from, but you don't take it too seriously, right? It depends on what I'm working on. If it's if if I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling something, yeah, I'm gonna be serious as fuck with it. But when when you got other guys coming over and you're just having a good time, you're doing your thing, we just enjoy it. You know, like if you come over to Theo's house or you go over to my house or you go over to Rick's or when Dilla was around, yeah, I'm gonna tell you something. The equipment is always gonna be on. There's no off button. And when you're in a studio with a lot of producers, something is about to get plugged or touched or something's about to go down. Kenny played the music and the shit was tight, man. It was really good. Only thing was he had so much of it, but you need your own record label. Mahogany came out because I wanted to, I had a label called KDJ Records. And the idea was that label when I first started was to just to put my brand out because no one wanted to put my music out. And as I started pressing records up, of course, I know that other people's talents that were in the same situation I went, well, no one's putting your shit out. Well, you can own your shit. I'll put it out for you. I said, let's make another label for the city of Detroit or for the rest of the world. And that's where Mahogany Music came in. I always used to carry a little tape deck. When you get your ideas, you got to hit it right there. Sometimes you don't have time to run to the studio. By the time you get there, trust me, you may remember what you said, but you're not necessarily going to remember how you said it, and you most definitely don't have that same feeling. So you get it right there on the spot with a tape deck. I could be anywhere. You know, motherfuckers, you look at me crazy. But sometimes I would just say, fuck it, just with the graspiness of the tape, we just use that. That's what this place come in for. I can redo it if I'm feeling like it. Ten years ago, I didn't give a fuck what nobody said. This is how it's going down, this is my way. Now I'm kind of lenient, sharing it with Wit and a few other people, not actually asking how do you like it, but does you need another mix? Can you make it sound better? My shit be all muddy and analogish. Coming over here can clean the situation out. My hands are in everything mahogany, but I like to be hands on. This is where Archer Records, home bases, all the original Motown stuff was pressed here. They've been taking care of us local Detroiters for a long time. And this is where all my shit's been pressed uh, since day one. Out of 99% of all record labels, can't say that. Oh, I'm gonna go around the corner and pick my records up. I wake up, the baby is born right there. Turn on the instrument, is born. The thought, the idea. Then from the idea, actually putting it on track. And from the track, now I leave in my basement to probably go downtown to a, my studio. We get it mastered right here in Detroit. And then we bring it from that point to here to get it pressed up. So until it gets to someone's hands, it's never left the city of Detroit until it's the final completion. I think it's great to Go see some of these owners of the record stores or, or business that are selling your product. I love dropping stuff. That's Detroit Threads right there. That's where we're going, but we got to find some parking. OK, here we are, this van right here. I got the records out here. So I know you probably get the records out for them. And this is a popular shirt right now. That's the album cover that's coming out. OK. I don't know if you're interested in any of those. Yeah. I'm not saying you can have them all, but I mean, it's up to you. You know what I'm I'd saying? Rather, I'd like to take them all. Really? Yeah. Oh, psh. I would take like five more boxes. What? <laughs> but you, you need to look what's in there first. Huh? You need to look what's in there. Well, I don't, I don't care. Oh, really? You want all of them? Yeah. All right, let's go. Doubles, I sell these for 20, 12, 10. We do 10, 12, 15 for this. We do 10 and five on these. First time I came overseas was a joke. I think I hung up on these people for almost a year. Or when you're from, where I'm from, and you, you don't know that part of the world yet. 
And when they was calling to ask me to come DJ in Paris, and they were like, we're looking for Kenny, or they would fax it over, and I thought it was a joke. So when I finally got on the phone and actually talked to someone, but my problem was, you ain't got no fucking DJs over there. And I was stupid, I'm like, I'm not bringing my amp, my speakers on no goddamn plane. And all my guy, I got to bring 10 crates of records on the plane. You ain't got no motherfucking DJs over there. I didn't know back then. I didn't know what the fuck was going on. I think that I talked to Carl later on, and I believe it was somebody else. And, oh man, they, they bringing people over there to DJ. And I just couldn't believe that shit, the DJ. And then when I got to Paris, I looked out in the crowd, I ain't seen no black folks. And I, I refused to believe they knew anything I played. I think the first two records, they was, you know, I ain't gonna say going crazy, but they knew the music. Japan was a whole different situation. Japan are educated. It's like they have a class on black music out there. They're telling me about my own shit. I like the color of Mexico. The people were beautiful there. They have a, a lot of heart, and they're just beautiful people. A lot of my music pops up everywhere in the world. I most definitely would say I am the best warm-up DJ there is. I'm also very unpredictable. I don't go up there with no plan set. Unfortunately, I'm like your parent. I'm gonna give you what you need. I, I'm not up there to show you how hot of a DJ I am. I'm up there to honestly share my environment. But around the world, it's, it's, it's beautiful enough that even people acknowledge me to even bring me back, which is amazing. Tell me about your relationship with style and, and how you, wh wh where does that fit into? I've never been a clothes guy. You've been an image guy though. There's always been something a bit mysterious about Moody Man, the name, the fact that you might play behind a curtain and there's a silhouette. And... My excuse was that when we grew up, we went to the club to get down and dance. Everybody knew the DJ and we didn't sit there and look at the DJ. He provided the music. We was more into the room. He provides the soundtrack, we make the movie. Well, nowadays, everybody just stands there and look at the DJ. It's not like that's Prince up there performing live. It's the fucking DJ. So when I was behind the screen, my attitude was, fuck me. Fuck the DJ. Fuck what I'm doing up here. Stop looking at me. I ain't doing nothing spectacular up here. I'm playing records. Yeah, I'm sure everybody has seen your daddy play records. We got half you guys out there probably DJs. There's no reason for you to be looking at me. Get down, boogie. Get your dance on. In today's modern era, the DJ is now the new rock star. So you have to adapt. They're going to, whether you like it or not, they're going to sit there and look at you. But you've got this thing at the moment with New Era, right? So these hats that you're doing right yeah, now. Yeah, fuck yeah. So they look good. That's, they're, very, they're very you. That's your look. <laughs> It was a blessing. They, you know, they called us like, "Hey, uh, we're interested." We thought it was a joke at first, but it was it was the real deal. And uh, next thing I know, I was up in the London office, you know, helping design some stuff that was new era like a motherfucker. My only demand was that we use the Detroit trademark English D. I just wanted to support my city. You know, the D. It is a strong symbol, man. We went through a lot. This country, this government, did everything they could do to damage this place. They didn't kill the spirit of nothing. We was wearing a D long before we made a record. I mean, your, your parents dressed you in that. It's church. Church is every, every day here with the D. They wear it on their heart. They wear it on their sleeves. A lot of people ask me, well, Kenny, you don't have no tattoos yet. Well, you know, the city of Detroit didn't gave me enough tattoos. I'd be damned if I pay for something. Detroit's always been a, a place that people from there honored and took, took it to heart. You know, wherever they lived at in the world, they had that Detroit dust always on the bottom of their shoes. We wear that badge of honor very proudly. It's, it's really one of the few things we have and it made me who I am today. All right.